Alright, thanks for watching and today I want to prove the extreme value theorem which simply says that the continuous function on a closed interval must have a maximum and a minimum. And this is super useful, remember, for all those optimization problems in calculus. So, definition, f has a maximum on the interval a comma b if the following thing holds, and let me illustrate this with a picture first of all. If you can find some x naught in your interval such that f of x naught is bigger than any other f of x. Such that f of x naught is really the maximum. It's bigger than any other f of x in your interval. Um, so if there is x naught in a comma b such that f of x naught is greater or equal to f of x so that's the important equation for all all x in a comma b right. now super important the maximum has to be attained Namely, you actually have to find some x naught such that that maximum is, in fact, f of x naught. And this is very important because consider the following non-example. If you have f of x equals to x squared on the open interval, 0, 2, so think here, this is 0, this is 2, zero and two are not in your interval, then this function actually has no max. Because, you see, intuitively, the maximum should be four, but four is not attained. There is no x naught in that interval such that f of x naught is four. So in fact, this function has no maximum, at least intuitively speaking. And therefore, it's also important that you have a closed and bounded interval. Um, and therefore, without further ado, let me state uh, the extreme value theorem. So fact, the extreme value theorem, if f from the closed interval, a comma b, to the real numbers is continuous, then f has a maximum and also a minimum. All right, and before we prove this, let's first of all prove a super useful lemma that's also used in the proof of the intermediate value theorem, which comes next. Okay. So useful lemma. And that actually just concerns not functions or what kind of real numbers, it just concerns general sets. So if you have a set S whose supremum is finite, so such that supremum of S, let's call this M, and that's finite. So if S is a non-empty, subset of R of R with the supremum of S and that's M but that's finite. Now here's the thing, the supremum is a really abstract concept if you remember the stuff from chapter one but what this is saying is it's not that abstract after all because you can always attain the supremum using sequences. More precisely, there must be a sequence in your set whose limit is M. Then there is Sn in S with Sn goes to M. In other words, there's always a train that goes to the supremum. So again, it's not that abstract after all. 
And let me prove this super quick, actually. It's one of those theorems that's harder to state than to prove. Okay. Well, for every n, a natural number, consider the following. m, but you just subtract the small number 1 over n. So we have the following. Again, this is s, this is the supremum m, and you just consider m minus 1 over m. Well, for sure this is less than m, which is the supremum. But this is like saying you're not the worst, the best student anymore, which means that there is a student who's better than you. So definitely, we can find some Sn in your set that is bigger than that number. So by definition of soup, of soup, we know that there is some element, let's call it Sn, there is some Sn in S with Sn is bigger than m minus 1 over n. However, also notice, since m is a supremum, so it is an upper bound, Sn also has to be less than or equal to m. But then, you can just use the squeeze theorem and conclude, well, this goes to m, this goes to m, so the middle one goes to m as well. So by squeeze theorem, What do we get? We get Sn goes to m, and then we're done. So there is a sequence that actually in your set that actually converges to the supremum. All right, and now let's prove the extreme value theorem, and you'll see it's very neat. And by the way, I will just show that f has a maximum. Because for the case of a minimum, just consider minus f. Because basically, if you repeat the proof of, with minus s, you get minus f has a maximum, and therefore f has a minimum. So you can try it out if you want. So, now, step one. Well, first of all, since f is continuous on the interval a comma b, We know that f is bounded, so there is some constant c positive such that absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to c for all x in a, b. Now here's the thing, what is this saying? It says that the values of f are trapped between minus c and c. Therefore, it might be useful to consider all the values of f. So let s be the set of f of x, where x is in the interval a comma b. So all the values of f, sometimes also known as the range of f. So now let me draw a picture that will be useful for the rest, so this is the interval a comma b, and this is maybe your function, might look something like that. Okay. This is f, and then what you want to consider is just the range of f. So in other words, for any x, you get f of x, which is in your set. And your set is really the set of all the f of x's, so it might look something like that, goes from here to here. And then notice, so the maximum of f is somewhere here, okay? Let's call this m, and well, it's actually also the biggest value of s. So it's actually very useful to consider the supremum of s. However, how do we know the supremum exists? Well, notice f is trapped between two values. So in particular, the outputs are trapped between minus c and c. 
And therefore, since f is bounded, f is bounded, again, f is between minus c and c, then f is between minus c and c, so s is bounded. But you see, S is just a set of real numbers, so you have a bounded set of real numbers, and therefore, S has a least upper bound. Hence, S has a least upper bound. Upper bound. Usually called the supremum of S, but here let's just label it as M. So our potential maximum, but really the big thing is we really want to show that M is in your set S. So that will be a whole work for that. Now, remember that S isn't such an abstract concept anymore. In other words, supremum of S isn't such an abstract concept because by our useful lemma, we can actually find a sequence that converges to our supremum. In other words, there is a sequence yn that converges to m. So, step two, if you want. Step two or step three, I don't remember. Uh, by the useful lemma. We know that there is a sequence. A sequence. Yn in S with Yn converges to capital M. So there's actually a sequence or a train that goes to capital M. Now, what do we know about S? Remember, S is the set of all values of f of x. So since Yn is in S, for sure Yn is f of something. So we can say with confidence that Yn equals f of xn for some xn. So, since yn is in S, by definition of S, we know that yn is f of xn for some xn in a comma b. That's just the definition of the range. It's the set of all values of f of x where x is in the interval a comma b. But then, what do we know about the sequence xn? Because you see, for every n you get an xn, but look, this sequence xn is trapped in the interval a comma b. So in fact, xn is bounded. Since it is in a comma b, and what do you know about bounded sequences of real numbers? bolzano Weierstrass. So Xn has a convergent subsequence. Therefore, by bolzano Weierstrass, Xn has a convergent subsequence. Subsequence. Xnk with Xnk converging to some X0 in a comma b. Okay. So again, you have this sequence xn. This thing has a convergent subsequence xnk. And we actually get that the xnks, they converge to some x0. Okay. And I'm claiming that actually x0 is the solution of our problem. So I'm claiming actually that f of x0 equals m. Okay, so that's step three. So again, just to reiterate, we have our supremum. We found a train converging to the supremum. By definition, each yn is of the form f of xn. xn is some sequence in a comma b. It has a convergent subsequence to x0. And I'm claiming that f of x0 is our solution. Because remember, we do have this maximum, but the goal is to show that the maximum is attained. 
So claim M is F of X naught. So I guess step three. F of X naught equals M. And it's actually not too hard to show because look, on the one hand, X and K converges to X naught. So since X and K converges to X naught and F is continuous, Notice we barely use the fact that f is continuous here. We get that f of x and k converges to f of x naught. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, remember, what was f of x n? That's just y n. But also, f of x n, which is y n, converges to by definition, Yn converges to capital M. So you see, the sequence f of xn converges to M, so the subsequence f of x and k must also converge to M. So f of x and k must also converge to M, again, being a subsequence of f of xn, and therefore, or if you want f of x and k, which is y and k, must also converge to m. And therefore, just by comparing the two limits, we get our result. We get that f of x naught equals m. And last but not least, uh, how do we, we know that the maximum is attained, but why is it the maximum? So claim. Step four, um, claim M is indeed the maximum of F. And why? Because, well, first of all, it's attained. And also, we get that, well, F of X naught, that's M. But remember, M was just the supremum of F of X where x is in a comma b. But then what does that mean? It means that for any x, the supremum is bigger than f of x. So that's bigger than or equal to f of x for all x. And therefore, indeed, m is the maximum of f, and therefore f of x naught is greater or equal to f of x, so for all x, and therefore f has a max. And that max is precisely m. And therefore we're done. So we feel extremely powerful because we've proved the extreme value theorem. All right, thank you very much.